Welcome to the Battle of Ideas. I'd just like to uh, explain the title. An American scholar, uh, Andrew Moravchik, uh, wrote a book called The Choice for Europe. And in that book, he argued that the EU, because it deals with expert questions like trade barriers, competition, reg regulation, legal adjudication, he thought that was stuff that ordinary voters shouldn't be bothered about. Uh, they should, in fact, be excluded from because it was best left uh, to technocrats and bureaucrats. A referenda on that basis were bad things because, as, and I quote, popular response uh, is likely to be ignorant, irrelevant, and ideological. The Euro European Union, on the other hand, he argued, has a great advantage in making sure it stays above the heads of the voters. The, quote, European Union's greatest tactical advantage is that it is, in a word, so boring. The whole European project was precisely about getting somewhat more boring times. Let's have some boring stability, peace, prosperity, all these boring things that ordinary people quite like. And I would say that in about 2005, we reached some sort of an apogee of the great project of achieving boredom. But of course it couldn't last. We had the largest crisis of Western capitalism since 1929, and it impacted particularly on the European Monetary Union, which was, in its design, deeply flawed. While Europe itself may not be boring, the institution of the European Union certainly are. But even those which are supposed to give the project democratic legitimacy, notably the directly elected European Parliament, don't get anyone's blood going. There is no theatre of politics. The turnout to European elections has declined in every election since 1979. Many particularly younger Europeans who don't remember the war, or the Holocaust, or the Gulag, or Eastern Europe under communist rule, or Franco, or even the wars of former Yugoslavia. So even in Estonia, even in Poland, take the achievements of the European Union for granted. They take it for granted that you can wake up on a Friday morning, buy a plane ticket, fly to the other end of the continent, you'll still be in a liberal democracy in the same European Union. The most profound reason for the crisis of the European project is the problem of success. And this is what I call the dialectic of boredom. It's the crisis of uh, the euro that has uh, prompted talks about refounding the union. I just uh, attended a, a talk in Brussels where uh, one of the four uh, luminaries in the panel fell asleep. Uh, so the EU is boring. It has made Europe boring, but that's exactly why it got the Nobel Peace Prize. 25 years ago, Europe, the EU became boring in a devilish way, in a new way. The single European act that was signed in 87 made a pledge to the creation of a single market based on four freedoms, the freedom of movement of good, goods, uh, services, capital, and money. Now notice how boring these four freedoms are. Compare them to the freedoms that Franklin Roosevelt spelled out. Freedom of speech, of uh, worship, freedom from want and fear. Now nobody is ready to die, I imagine, for our uh, EU fundamental freedoms. Then there is one little technical trick, that EU law that is there to protect the internal market has supremacy over national law. So it trumps everything that, it, that stands in the way of that logic of the creation of, of this huge uh, free market. So what we have at some point is a boring but very powerful monster that has the, the power to create the, the cucumbers straight, but at the same time submits all of us to the logic of the competitive production of cucumbers. Within that logic, there is no place for politics. It, we are ruled by uh, the TINA logic. There is no alternative. So I don't think that the trouble is with any democratic deficits or even with the shrinking sovereignty. The trouble is that logic of European uh, market integration has entailed a socially irresponsible rule that democratic parliaments are not going to um, stand in the way. The award of the Peace Prize is actually quite helpful because it puts its finger on the foundational 
myth of the EU, and this is the myth of the EU as a peace product, the myth of the EU as being boring. The euro, designed not on um, any rational economic uh, criteria or any basis of integration, um, but rather by the desire to um, shackle a reunified Germany. After the war, Eastern Europe, with a lot of untidy borders, were handed by the Western powers at the altar over to to the Stalinist uh, dictatorship. The moral price in the post-1945 era of that easier Europe to deal with was because Europe had been smashed. The European Union that we know today does not have its origins in post-war Europe. In terms of the institutions that are wreaking so much destruction across Europe at the moment, in terms of the single currency, their real origins are in the uh, reunification of Germany and the fact that the reunification of Germany was seen as an enemy-friend situation. It was seen as a problem. Now, I would argue that the EU's real contribution to the post-war and current period was less about peace than the foundation of a new political order that's premised on the idea that untrammeled public politics in the form of conflicting national interests leads to war. And this outlook actually has its antecedents in the fascist era and in right-wing conservative and Nazi thinkers who also regarded war as imminent in politics. All conflicts of interest for the EU are seen as dangerous. And the EU has evolved as a set of institutions that is about dampening and taking politics away from the cockpit um, of interest. But actually, the conflicts of interests is absolutely basic to the idea of European being European. It was the conflicts of interests and the battles for interests that gave rise in Europe against the old empires to institutions that genuinely represented us. That was swept away in the 1930s by fascism um, and it led to war. In Europe, nobody's really scared about war. I have been reading a lot of public opinion polls. The problem is that Europeans don't believe that war exists for them. What makes the project so difficult to excite people is that you cannot imagine what the collapse of the European Union means. Just tell me, what does it mean? If United Kingdom decides to leave the European Union, is this the disintegration of the Union? If Greece is going to be expelled out of the Euro, is this the end of the world? If Bulgaria is not going to be there, how much are you going to be affected? Nobody's really managed to imagine the catastrophe coming out of it. Uh, And also there is a problem with the politicians, because it's not easy to be a politician these days in Europe. Because in one and the same sentence you should send two different messages. You should tell to the markets that the situation is not as bad as it looks. And you should tell to the people that the situation is much worse than they believe. Because you want the markets to be calm and people to be ready to sacrifice. Difficult to be done in one sentence. The basic problem is that behind this boredom, there is a very radical project behind what's happening in the European Union now. And this project is very much the suspension of politics. What democracy is going to mean is that you can change governments and not change policies. How exciting it is. Voter is basically getting himself to be in charge of the personnel. He used to be the boss and now he's the head of the human resources department. (laughs) There was this study of the Euro... uh, Barometer which discovered that support for the common European institutions strongly correlates with mistrust in national democracies. Countries in which people don't believe that their vote matters are much more ready to support the establishment of common institutions than the countries in which voters believe that they still matter. And I'm saying, saying this because for the last 30 years there was a positive kind of a link between European integration and democratization. And probably we're seeing a moment in which this type of link is going to be strongly questioned. The so-called dialectic of boredom, which I I would dispute, is really about taking institutions, getting institutions as insulated as possible from society. And what we're now seeing is a situation where institutions have become so estranged from society that they are acting against society. So so, they're more than unrepresentative. They're actually antisocial, and what we can see with the Troika in southern Europe is a manifestation of antisocial institutions. There is a fear of politics that was very much what basically Europe inherited from the 1920s and 30s. I mean, of course, fear from the totalitarian politics, but also fear of democratic politics. In order to be bored, you should be a spectator. If you're part of something, you're not bored. 
The problem with Europe is that, in a way, we all are spectators of the European Union. And I do believe that there is a major problem with the left in Europe. Even if you compare 1968 with the people that have been in the streets of Madrid and here and others, 1968, the message of the students on the street was, we do not want to live in the world of our fathers. Now the message is, allow us to live in the world of our fathers. I sort of feel we're being a bit pessimistic about the past here. I think we have to recognize what an ex extraordinary achievement the European Union has been. Make Georgia or not war war. I mean, the European Union has been the most fantastic system of peaceful conflict regulation. It created a framework in which Germany could be reunited peacefully. I agree that the price for that was that it was a project of the elites. The Eurocrats may be afraid of popular passions. I'm not. We need an in or out referendum on whether we want to stay in the European Union or not. Because yeah. only thus can you lance the boil. Otherwise, pro-Europeans are always constantly on the defensive, constantly looking anti-democratic. Now, yes, it is in that sense a counter-enlightenment because it leaves no, sen no place for agency. Where does that leave us? Uh, we, we cannot simply continue with effort to save the euro, to overcome this crisis, because this is not enough to mo motivate publics to accept uh, the, the high social cost. You know, to have agency, we, we need a different idea of, of why the European Union. Why is he take all these decisions um, in secret? And you'll, you'll talk to ambassadors and officials in Brussels, I'll be absolutely frank with you. As soon as you go public, the, what are being discussed as technical issues, like the European arrest warrant, anything but technical, become subjected to clashing interests and political principles that have no existence in EU uh, treaties, legalistic norms. So any leader who's negotiating in Brussels, he certainly doesn't want his own people, um, his own nation or her voters um, to see um, what they're talking about so they can discuss real issues of interest in a conflict Free zone. We have a directly elected European Parliament. It doesn't do the business. I think direct elections for the President of the European Commission, in my personal opinion, would make not the blind bit of difference. We don't have a European demos, we don't have a European public sphere, we don't have European media, we all speak different languages. I actually don't think it would work. I personally think we'd be better off if we hadn't had direct elections to the European Parliament starting in 1979 but had a system whereby national parliaments became more and more involved in EU decision-making. We'd be much better off. If you look at Greece today, uh, the policy of the European Union is rather producing anger and hatred. So it's more than, than boredom. One thing which um, has characterized Angela Merkel's politics right from the beginning is her absolute fear of any political debate. And is it not... Um, national politicians hiding behind the EU and thereby sort of justifying their own retreat from politics and their own fear of political debate and then, and then pointing towards the TINA. This is the paradox. In all polls you're going to see that countries like Greece or Italy, which is very hostile to the policies coming from Brussels today, are much more ready to go for common institutions and political union. And the reason is that mistrust to the national political elites is one of the major sources of legitimacy for the European Union. The critical moment for the EU is going when this is going to change. But what do we mean by George Orwell? Do we mean um, international relations as Woodrow Wilson wanted to see it out in the open, all protocols to treaties um, and all um, government documents um, published? Or do we want the world of a troika where foreigners write your legislation and present it to you and you pass it um, in your parliament. That legislation is drawn up in cabals in the Commission and the European Central Bank. That kind of jaw jaw we don't want because it's about upholding institutions such as the Euro in the teeth of popular um, opposition. The trouble is, when you look at the canvas alternatives uh, and even some of these new movements, what's their alternative? It's, it's Sweden. Basically, it's a sort of slightly more left-wing version of social democratic capitalism.